Welcome everybody. It's 4 p.m. Italian time, so it's time for Food for Veins and Veins for Food. As always, we will welcome 30 seconds to allow everybody to be welcome in the platform. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And welcome everybody again to Food for Veins and Veins for Food, a not-for-profit humanitarian and educational initiative that always start with the heart and art of Monica Globinski, dedicated to all the young professionals around the world who have shown such a good heart in this tough COVID time to which this also humanitarian project is dedicated, meaning the support to the post lockdown economic crisis that has been reported recently by the Lancet Journal Call. Nothing would have been possible without a truly stellar faculty of friends and world-renowned experts and the many colleagues and friends who have joined us along the way. And this is the chance to deeply thank also the many attendees of the last Sunday webinar. As we deeply thank Professor Mark Meisner and Professor Neil Kiljani for having taken extra time after last Sunday webinar to reply to all the questions we have received during the live in whatever language. I remind you that also today you can make your questions in your language, simply writing them in the question and answer box. The ones that will uh, receive more likes will be answered live. On the other ones, uh, because of course of time uh, limitations, will be answered during the week in a written form and posted in uh, the Pewin Foundation website. Today we focus on the important topic of lasers for spider veins. As always, uh, we deliver international and national CME credits and as always we enjoy top speakers in the person of Fabricio Santiago and Raul Gindal. We will introduce them properly later on. I take this chance to deeply thank once again Professor Gindal and Professor Santiago but also Professor Kazumiaki and Professor Goldman for having taken part in extra educational material delivery in the form of recorded video lessons you can find inside the Bwin Foundation educational platform. I take this chance to deeply thank Professor Kikuchi, Professor Mann, Professor Miyaki once again for their role as honorary chairs, meaning that they will wrap up the concepts we all should take home after this webinar, but not before having enjoyed the precious contributions of our continental top experts. We will introduce them one by one later on during the scientific moment of the webinar. Nothing would have been possible, as I was saying, without uh, a truly global effort uh, involving uh, the faculty, individual donors, uh, and also what we call the magnificent seven companies who provided unrestricted grants in the person of Amno, Balton, Bayer, Medi, Servier, Sigvaris, Tactile. I deeply thank uh, all this uh, group, and uh, I truly hope that all this group will be together once again in a food moment at this uh, time dedicated uh, not just uh, to humanitarian and educational support, but also to the pleasure of being together once again. Today, we could have been together for celebrating with a birthday cake our friends Marco Andes Figueiredo from Brazil since it's his birthday. And as always, uh, nothing would have been possible without a tremendous teamwork with uh, the ones I consider not just top colleagues and friends, but also family. So the mic now is to Professor Bottini in Argentina. Oscar. Thank you, Sergio. Dear friends, it's a pleasure to be here again with friends and experts from all around the world, sharing and enjoying an, another scientific science Sunday. Remember the question and answer box is waiting for your question, which can be made in any language. Les recuerdo que pueden realizar sus preguntas en el box de preguntas y respuestas en español durante la presentación. Bienvenidos una vez más. Thank you so much, Oscar. Willie from California, 7 a.m. Thank you for the commitment. Thank you, dear friends, dear colleagues. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, let's enjoy the show again. 各位同道们,各位朋友们,大家早安,午安,晚安。今天是我们第十一次的网络网会,请大家如果有任何问题,请在我们的答问箱里问答,我们会继续快的给您 um, and thank you so much, Willie, also for the coordination with the Chinese friend. As you know, we always start 
with a guest of honor who is uh, coming from a world outside the Venus Award, but uh, that in some sort of way is uh, contributing to public uh, health and also Venus and lymphatic awareness. This is a top moment for us. Uh, it's a huge honor having uh, with us today Gianpaolo Montali. Gianpaolo Montali is the general director of the Golf Rider Cup uh, that will be held in Rome in 2023, one of the largest uh, sport events in the world. He has experiences also in the major leagues of volleyball and soccer. He is a sport world ambassador for Rome. And uh, he also has uh, written a very interesting textbook I really suggest you to read that is really in line with the vision uh, of uh, our friends and colleagues, which uh, is entitled How to Win in the Organization by Teamwork. And here is his message. Dear Hall, first of all, I apologize for my English. Being here as a guest of honor in front of you all, all renowned experts, is actually my true honor. In the same way, it's a real honor for me to represent the Italian Gulf War and testify the constant attention this amazing sport is dedicating to health promotion. Transversely to whatever nation, age, and gender. And I am pleased through initiatives like the one of today to have learned the calf pump is considered like a peripheral heart because we truly need to make our peripheral and central heart beat together along the 18 holes of Rome's 2023 Ryder Cup. Whereas ons again the real winners will be sociality, sport and of course the promotion of the good health. Since I thanking you all for the contribution you are given around the world, particularly in this challenging time, to people's health. I wish you the most productive continuation of this commendable humanitarian and educational initiative. All the best possible. And with this, we deeply thank you, uh, Gianpaolo Montali, for uh, the important uh, contribution in uh, public health uh, promotion through the Ryder Cup 2023. As you know, we always try to keep the atmosphere alike, coupling our Venus legends with artistic or sports legend. And of course, in honor of Gianpaolo Montali, we have to stay together on uh, the sports legend. And for this uh, reason, uh, it is easy for me to make uh, the comparison of our Fabricio Santiago with the big Michael Jordan, as you can see, is also expressing himself in sport during our past events, looking forward for having him again in the future ones. Fabricio Santiago is uh, the head of the Institute for Venus and Lymphatic Disease. He has interesting publications in PubMed regarding aesthetic phlebology. And we are used to say that it's not just where you are going, but also who you are traveling with. And of course, Raquel Santiago is the best ID that Fabricio could uh, present to us. So Fabricio, we are looking forward for hearing from you about aesthetic laser in phlebology instructions for users on the available devices. Hello, good morning. Let me share my screen first. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let's start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Sergio, for this kind invitation. Uh, my name is Fabricio Santiago. I'm a Brazilian vascular surgeon, and I'm going to talk to you about aesthetic lasers in phlebology and the instructions for users on available devices. I have no disclosures for this presentation other than my personal passion for the vein and lymphatics field. As you can see here, we have uh, uh, what we've been doing so far, uh, cooperating with some national and international centers and also uh, by performing some very nice investigations. Some of them are going to be published very soon. Let's start from the beginning. Um, this is what we have when we're talking about transcutaneous lasers. Uh, this uh, down part, we have the handpiece. And inside this handpiece, we have a small box where we have a laser medium 
that can be a solid laser, a gas, or can be a dye. And this uh, medium is going to be stimulated by an electrical, an optical, or a thermal source. Usually it's going to be an electro, uh, electrical source, a flash lamp, and it's going to dislocate the electrons from their original orbit. Yes. So when the, electro, the electrons comes back to the, to the orbit, uh, so we'll have the photons. Uh, by opening the cavity and uh, with the help of a pair of lenses, voila, we have the laser beam that is going to be always coherent, always monochrome, and always be collimated uh, running mm -hmm. into uh, parallel rays. Once the laser uh, reaches the tissue, we'll have some basic phenomena occurring. We'll have uh, absorption, what is our, that is our main goal, uh, actually, but we'll have some transmission, we'll have some scattering, and we'll have also some reflection. And the intensity of these, re these uh, interactions, they are going to depend on the wavelength that you're using, on the spot size, on the energy that uh, translated by fluency is the uh, division of energy by the spot size, and the pulse duration or exposure time uh, in, is, is going to be chosen by the thermal relaxation time, uh, that is the time taken for the structure to lose half of its temperature. So let's see something about the literature. Uh, this is a not yet published review that has been made by a Brazilian group of investigators. Uh, where They are comparing uh, different treatment modalities for telangiectasis and reticular veins. Uh, Dr. Nakano kindly uh, uh, allowed me to show uh, some preliminary results. And we will see that uh, when we compare this, the, these different uh, treatment modalities, we have no differences in uh, terms of efficacy. This is very good showing that transcutaneous laser works really well for the, this type of indication. But on the other hand, we know that uh, we're not talking about human material. We're talking about the material that is used for performing sclerotherapy. Uh, as an example, it's a lot cheaper than the laser devices. We have some contraindications according to the, the literature. They are not absolute. Uh, really careful by using lasers in pregnant patients, patients with tanned skin, patients using ferric supplements, supplements and photosensibility disorders, patients with hypertrophic scars, when you're treating patients with previous herpes on the area, patients with active skin infection, and in cases of open wound, although we know that we have some wavelengths that can stimulate also the granulation. We have several types of lasers from different laser mediums generating different wavelengths uh, with uh, different indications, advantages and disadvantages. We won't have time for discussing all of this, uh, but we have some guidelines uh, published. This is a guideline published by the European Society for Laser and Dermatology from 2015, showing that we have high recommendation ratings for different types of lesions, of course, with different scientific backgrounds. So this is a figure taken by the book of Professor Goldman showing the basis of what we call the selective photothermalysis theory. This is a theory showing that uh, for different wavelengths, we have different uh, chromophores and different uh, absorption coefficient peaks uh, correlating to the different wavelengths. So now what the, I want to show you attention for this wavelength. Uh, I want to, all, all phlebologists must keep the, tens, the infrared 1064 nanometer wavelength in mind. It, this is because, uh, not many people know that, but it is not a so good, it doesn't have a not so good hemoglobin absorption coefficient, as we can see here on the, 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 the figure, but uh, it does not interact, it interacts poorly with the melanin, on the other hand, allowing us to use on high Fitzpatrick skin type patients and also allowing us to treat larger and deeper vessels once the 1064 uh, penetrates more. So uh, when we look at the literature, uh, again, we can see that uh, with a high recommendation grading and with a high level of evidence, we have the 1064 uh, indicated for treating leg veins, although not indicated with high recommendation grading for some other lesions, but we know that the 1064 nanometers works really well and can be used for treating different vascular lesions. And we are going to show you some slides here from some cases. They are from my private practice. All the patients signed an informant consent for this presentation. 
and uh, I'm going to show you, uh, for an example, the monotherapy for challenge ectasis. I ask you to, to pay attention for the parameters that uh, we are going to use. This is a situation where we treat, for an example, spider veins with the optimal result. This is obviously, uh, we don't have always this, this kind of result, but once we have the total disappearance of the spider vein, you do not, you need to do nothing else uh, or uh, perform, and as, for an example, it's therapy. This is an example of a situation where the monotherapy worked really well for reticular veins. The above pictures we have the pre uh, the pre uh, treatment photos, and uh, below we have post treatment photos. The immediate result using different parameters that uh, we have used in the previous situation. Some other indications where the 1064 works really well. This is something that I've been doing a lot. From the, uh, with the patients that comes to the office uh, for treating leg veins, treating uh, cherry angiomas. We've been treating venous lakes with very good results in the mouth, in, uh, sometimes in the oral cavity, uh, facial telangiectasis in the, in the face. And this is a situation that I really uh, uh, need to ask you to pay a good attention because especially in the nose, we have a protegament, so the chances of having an ulceration here uh, increases. As you can see, we use the small spot size uh, with uh, fluency higher than uh, we were using in the previous slides with uh, larger vessels. This is another example of facial veins, bulging veins in the temporal area with a very nice result, as you can see in the post-treatment pictures, using the adequate parameters for that. And this is an orbital vein with a very nice result as well. And I, uh, this is the basis for using the 1064, for an example. Uh, when we compare the small vessels with the large vessels, you can see that we usually, for small vessels, we usually use small spot size because we need to bring the, the laser to the surface and we have to decrease the pulse duration according to the TRT of the vessel. Usually the TRT are lower than the larger vessels but we have to increase the energy and this happens especially because when you bring the, the laser to the surface, more scattering is going to occur and you have to compensate by increasing also the energy. On the other hand, for, for larger vessels, you, uh, we usually use a larger spot size because it needs to penetrate more, uh, increasing the pulse duration according to the thermal relaxation time of the structure, but we need to uh, um, use less energy than uh, when we're comparing with the small vessels. This is the first problem that we're facing when we're using a transcutaneous lasers. When we look to the lower limb venous universe, we know that we have several connections of the telangiectasis and the reticular veins with the superficial system, the saphenous veins, or the deep venous system. Uh, it doesn't matter if, uh, if it's reflexive or not. We'll have difficulties on treating some uh, types of patients because of hemodynamics problem. And this is why we usually use association of techniques, uh, the transcutaneous laser with sclerotherapy in these situations. We have some publications. We have uh, Moreno Moraga's technique, it's a, a group uh, of Spanish uh, colleagues that have published the use of foam first, and after that, uh, the use of transcutaneous laser in this situation, where the chromoform is going to be the bubbles, and we have a very well-known technique that is the CLACS that uh, was developed by Dr. Kazumiyaki. This is a Brazilian technique that have been, uh, has been performed all around the world with very uh, nice results as well. And the other problem is the pain caused, especially by the 1064 nanometers. This is an investigation that we have presented in 2011, comparing transcutaneous laser and sclerotherapy in, in lag-based treatment using the visual analog scale and analyzing with analysis of variance. And we can see here that we have a more pain by using, for an example, the six uh, uh, millimeters spot size when comparing with the sclerotherapy. Then for that pain management, we usually need to cool the skin. We have some uh, literature showing that by cooling the skin, we'll have less pain and we need to cool the skin also for protect the skin uh, from heating. This, uh, the most of the guidelines uh, tell us to do for pain management and also for the skin protection. And this is the, the, the other problem. This, uh, the laser devices are, they are really expensive. 
So I really advise you to make some math about that, or if you do not want, you need to consult a financial expert. This is an example of calculation, for an example, of the return of your investment, or you can also make some partnerships uh, to minimize the cost with other phlebologists or uh, with uh, some dermatologists uh, for that. Well, don't, it doesn't matter the reason you decided to buy a laser device. This is probably the golden instruction of my presentation. Do not look only for the yellow door. Do not uh, 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 buy these devices only for treating lag veins. Uh, you have to explore the best that you can for treating cherry angiomas. It can treat breast veins, facial veins, superficial angiomas, spider angiomas, and it can treat also some venous lakes with very nice results as I have showed you before. Some innovations and new perspectives. This is a publication where Sergio Giannazzini uh, was involved by mixing wavelengths for treating uh, small telangiectasias. This is a portable device that has been developed by a South American company for treating telangiectasias. They are showing very nice results with it. And these uh, are some new perspectives but because we know that the 1064 usually comes uh, with the NDI uh, laser medium, and this is a publication where they have used the diode laser, and this could minimize the costs of the device. We need to know that this is a brand new technology. Only in 1960, Charles Towns gave birth to the laser technology, and Anderson and Parrish have published only in 1981 the selective photothermolysis theory. And uh, this is how we choose nowadays our post, uh, our post duration. This is the thermal relaxation time, as I told you. Uh, nowadays, we've been working with the thermal damage time. This is an example of how we choose our parameters uh, in accordance to pulse duration. But this is what we need to keep in mind. In the present and in the future is the heinous thermal damage equation. As I told you, we've been discussing more thermal damage time rather than thermal relaxation time. It works with uh, the accumulated tissue damage. It works with the naturing time and also with the composition uh, frequency that we are giving to our structure. I deeply thank to all colleagues that have embraced the cause and especially for the colleagues from Fogarty da Madrugada. They have an Instagram uh, channel with very nice publications using the draws for making more attractive and they have developed this uh, very nice draw uh, for us. And uh, although we're having, we've been having very nice online meetings, I really appreciate, but I really want to meet some uh, very nice and very good colleagues in person so that we, have, we can have a toast about everything that we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fabricio, and congratulations for having brought uh, science uh, into this uh, topic that is really needing that. Uh, and I hope that soon I will receive also a mug that I haven't received yet. So now we start uh, the scientific world round, where, as you know, we invite the keynote uh, figures uh, to give us uh, their perspective and a revision of the keynote lecture you have already enjoyed. So it's my pleasure to fly all the way to Russia with Eugene Berznoy, a dear friend of the Viewing Foundation involved also with our humanitarian mission. Eugene is a great expert in laser. So Eugene, please make your question to Professor Santiago. Hello, dear Sears colleagues and friends. It's a big honor and also big pleasure as well to be involved into this amazing humanitarian education project. Deeply thanks for this for all organizers, Oscar Battini, Willy Chi, and Sergio Giannizini. My congratulations for you, dear Fabricio, your presentation was excellent. My question is, currently where no accurate recommendations and guidelines regarding optimal diameter of reticular veins when transdermal laser 1064 nanometer can be used. Some authors say it should be anywhere between 1.5 to 3.0 millimeter. What diameter of reticular vein would you optimally treat with this laser? or what main criteria you will use to select laser power. You will look at the vein diameter or vessel type red or blue or the depth vessels. Thank you. Wow, Eugene, thank you very much for your questions. I don't know if I uh, will have time to answer all of them, but uh, regarding, this is a very, very nice question. Uh, regarding the, the choosing of the, it, it really it's not power, but it's energy. 
but uh, really we do not have cutoff points for uh, treating uh, reticular veins. We have some publications, if I'm not mistaken, we have a publication from 2003 from, I, I know, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, Dr. Omura showing that they had very nice results treating three millimeter uh, veins, for an example. But um, in daily practice, we have some limitations. First is when you uh, decrease the, the vessel uh, diameter, uh, you have to use larger post durations and also you have to increase a little bit more your energy. The patient will not tolerate the pain. And uh, um, if I can tell you a cutoff point, I, I can tell you that, for an example, as monotherapy, we're not talking about association of techniques right now. We're talking about transcutaneous lasers. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, until up to two millimeters, we have very nice results with uh, monotherapy for reticular veins. Above that, probably the patient will not tolerate the pain, especially above three millimeters. And you will also have the problem of uh, microtrombi. So anyway, uh, regardless of uh, sclerotherapy or, or uh, laser, transcutaneous laser, you have microtrombi, so you have to, to do a very, uh, use a very nice extrinsic compression so you don't have uh, microtrombi. So we do not have, you do not have this cutoff point, but probably would be uh, two millimeters with optimal results without having side effects just as pain and microtrombi. Regarding the other questions, I probably am going to send you and text you so uh, I can uh, answer you properly and to the other colleagues as well. That's, that's a great idea, Fabricio, and thank you, Eugene. Indeed, uh, it's a chance to remind everyone you can make your question in the question and answer box so that will be answered live or in written form. Now it's uh, my pleasure to leave the mic to Professor Chi to fly all the way to Latin America and introduce the next continental expert representative. Willie? Yeah, next we have a great personal friend and a friend to uh, VUN, Marcelo uh, Grill from Central de Studios, Hiroshimaki. Marcelo? Hello, Willy. Hello, Fabricio. Are you listening to me? Yes. Yes. So, Fabricio, uh, your lecture was really, really clear. And in the matter of techniques association, which one we should first, the laser or the sclerotherapy? A uh, very, very nice question, Marcella. Once my, uh, my, my chromophore is going to be the hemoglobin, I prefer to use, according to the laser physics and the principles of uh, selective phototermalysis, I prefer to use the laser first. And after that, using sclerotherapy. As I, I mentioned in my slide, we have some other techniques uh, using first the, the, the foam and after that, using the laser. But as you can uh, notice, uh, the chromophore is going to be the bubbles. Uh, it not the, the hemoglobin. So I prefer it according to the, the physics and uh, the development of the laser for treating lag veins to use first uh, the, the laser. And uh, we also know that, the, for example, the Clax technique, uh, they, uh, we do not intend to, to, to that the, very, the vein disappears. We intend to use a, a low profile laser so that we have an edema of the media and then we inject a, a few, uh, just a few uh, volume of the sclerosis and agent, okay? Thank you so much, uh, Marcello and uh, Fabricio. And now we fly on the way to Italy, thanks to Professor Bottin, who is introducing a dear friend of mine and also our continental expert representative for Europe. Oscar? Thanks, Sergio. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Demetrio Guarnacchia, president of the Italian Association of Revology. Demetrio? Demetrio, Bernaccia. Senti, okay? Yes. Allora. Congratulations uh, for the good uh, presentation, uh, Fabrizio Santiago. Congratulations, uh, Sergio Gensini, for a uh, webinar uh, good interest. For the treatment of uh, aesthetic vein for laser is uh, so important. Knowledge of different type of laser, have different type laser available, extensive laser experience, choose the right patients of treat. One question, one question. Despite the literature at our disposal, do you think that grade 1A for the treatment of leg vein 
according to guideline from the European Society for Laser Dermatology with laser 1064 is appropriate. According to the European experience of fibrology, the best treatment in terms in term of efficacy and safety is the sclerotherapy. What do you think about that, Fabrizio, please? Very, very nice question. Thank you for this question. Uh, this is very important because when we look at the recommendation gradients, it's very important to know the scientific background for that. And I, and I agree with, with you with that because when you see the literature that has been referred uh, in this uh, guideline, for example, we know that is not totally consistent, but, but we have some literature supporting that for treating lag veins, especially the reticular veins, we have some very good scientific background. And, and, and as I showed you in the slide, we have this review, it's not yet published, but they allowed me to show some previous results. And there are no differences between the efficacy when we're doing the, the when we're using treatment, uh, laser treatment and comparing with sclerotherapy. I mean, I mean efficacy, okay? So uh, sclerotherapy uh, for most the authors and uh, most guidelines is, is, is still the, the golden, uh, I mean, uh, the gold standard for treating uh, leg veins. We do not, we have no doubt about that. This is, this is true, but as I mentioned, if you're trying to use laser for treating your patients, I do not advise you to buy just to treat leg veins. You need to treat in association and you need to explore the, 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 your laser more to use for other indications so that you can explore your device the best that you can, okay? Thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Guarnaccio and Fabricio. It's uh, my pleasure now to fly all uh, the way to North America with a dear friend uh, from uh, the American Veins and Lymphatic Society and also the University of California, San Diego, Professor Vinit Mishra, a great expert on the field. Vinit? Hey, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to be part of this. This is my first time. Uh, wonderful lecture. Um, first off, I uh, just had a couple questions about nasal veins. I have had some uh, difficulty in treating nasal veins because I find that A, they tend to come back, high rate of recurrence. B, uh, some, sometimes the veins don't respond. I've used KTP 532, I've used uh, pulse dye, uh, NDAG. Any tips or tricks for the audience on how to treat nasal vessels, which are high flow? Yes, uh, this is a very nice question. I have the same difficulties that you have. Um, in the cases that where we do not have the, a good response with the 1064, we tend to use the IPL with some very nice results, especially those tiny, tiny one, the tiny telangiectasias. But uh, you know better than me that the problem with the uh, telangiectasias in the face it's uh, also related to uh, sun exposure. So patients usually have a recurrence because of the uh, are exposing their their skin to the sun without the, the appropriate protection. So this is something that occurs not only because of the hemodynamics problem, but also because of the laser exposure. So uh, if I'm not willing, I'm not having good results with the 1064, uh, I really uh, recommend you to be really careful with the 1064 in the nasal veins because you can cause a real uh, a trouble problem with that. I advise you to use shorter wavelengths just like the KTP uh, and we've been using the IPL with very good results. And you also need to tell your patients, lower your uh, patient's expectations. So you need to tell them that if that can come back, that cannot be uh, treated uh, uh, as expected, okay? Thank you for your question. Thank you, Vin, and thank you, Fabricio, and deeply thank to all the continental experts involved in uh, this World Scientific Round. And now it's time to leave the mic to the audience, uh, Fabricio. And we are looking at the questions who have received more likes. And uh, we start from a Spanish-speaking uh, colleague. So we try to translate for you the question of Sergio Rix Castro. And he's asking you if it is advisable to treat first uh, the reticular veins uh, by sclerotherapy and then uh, the telangiectasia by laser and how to avoid uh, pigmentations after transdermal laser. And Professor okay. Prego from uh, Uruguay actually replied already with absolutely. So let's see if you agree with our friend uh, Alfredo. Okay. Uh, I really uh, like to treat, uh, we have a problem that uh, usually the patients come to the office, they, they are willing to treat everything in just one time. 
So I, I really uh, treat the reticular veins and after that I treat the telangiectasias. We have some colleagues that prefer especially using sclera therapy that they are used to treat the reticular veins that are so-called feeder veins that we, don't, we know that this is not the, the real concept, but uh, and after that they, they treat the telangiectasias. Uh, we usually uh, use to treat in just, in just one time. And uh, the second part of the question was? How to avoid the pigmentation. Oh yeah, uh, uh, usually a transcutaneous laser, uh, especially in the reticular veins, what we see is some uh, contraction of the vein. We do not have a lot of uh, microthrombi when the parameters are right. And I, I tend to use when the, the veins there are above 1.5 or, or up to two millimeters by using eccentric compression along with uh, uh, compression stockings during uh, 24 to 72 hours to avoid this kind of complication if I'm thinking that is going to occur, okay? Thank you so much uh, for the question from the colleagues and also for your answer. Now we move to the second question, Fabricio. Isabella giardulli Sichman is uh, writing, hi, very good talk. So if the patient has telangiectasia that would have an excellent result with conventional sclerosis, would you still do laser? Uh, yes, because I have it. So uh, I, always, I, I always use laser first because uh, as I showed you in, uh, in that video, when the, we have a total disappearance of the telangiectasia, I don't need to inject uh, anything else. I don't need to do anything else. So this is because I have the laser with me. So I tend to use the laser as much as I can. And uh, CLAX is my preferred technique for treating C1, not a complicated C1 patients with very nice results. Uh, some comparison results there in a doctor, we don't have the appropriate randomized controlled trials for that, but in daily practice, we see that the results are really good. Uh, and uh, I prefer to use laser first and we do not, do not have any result. And after that, I use this clear presentation. And then we move forward for the last question and maybe the colleague uh, uh, knew that you are one of the authors of a very interesting paper on this topic. Let me translate for you from Italian. How would you suggest uh, to document uh, telangiectasia before and after the treatment? Very, very nice question. Uh, I have a concept uh, that I call a so-called uh, the, the curtain effect. If your patient is standing, you can see bulging veins more appropriately, and this is the time that you need to take pictures. Otherwise, if you have reticular veins and spider veins, the patients need to be laid down. So this is because the, the skin has some uh, cumulative layers or when the patient lies, lays, lies down, the, the, this curtain effect, they, it disappears. So it, it, uh, it's more clear to take pictures from telangiectasis and reticular veins with the pain the lay in the line position, okay? Thank you so much, Fabrice, and also Dr. Parisella for the question. And now we are finishing uh, this uh, first session of the webinar. I hope you could uh, hear all the people clapping you. We are like hundreds and hundreds of people here. So thank you so much, uh, Fabrice, and all the faculty involved so far. And now it's time to move forward for the second part. And uh, as I had to introduce uh, Fabrice as Michael Jordan, I had to find uh, an equally a great sport professional in honor of India. So Nandra Joig is a, a great squash player in honor also of the good squash moments we had with our master of squash, Professor Sridham Narayan. Raul Jindal indeed is one of our champ. He's coming from the Punjab University. We all know him as a great innovator and also educator. And we personally know him as a wonderful example of professionalism and the human attitude uh, during our be health uh, missions. So Professor Raul Jindal is getting ready to give us uh, his talk about aesthetic lasers in phlebology, possible complications and their management. Raul, uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, ready to share your screen. Can you hear us, Raul? Yeah, I can yes. hear you. That's Good evening. Great. And uh, so you thank you for your introduction and uh, thank you for giving the part. I'm just going to go through an aesthetic phlebology. What are the possible complications and management? Uh, you see, the stock would not have been uh, complete without the help of Professor Goldman, Kasamiaki, Giovanni, and patients and Fortis Hospital. I really acknowledge them, all of them, in uh, preparation for this talk. We all know about the C classification. And we are going to uh, cater mainly the telangiectasias and the reticular veins, the C1 in my talk here. 
We know about that if you have a huge varicose veins like this, you get a fantastic result with the laser and the sclerotherapy of the lipectomies. What we don't still have the gold guidelines for the reticular veins and telangiectasias. You know, reticular veins are the veins which are behind, it's below the skin, it's subdermal. They are one to three millimeters as compared to telangiectasia, which could be red and blue, and they are 0 0.1 to two millimeters and they are in the dermis. So that's the basic difference between the, these two veins. And there are various methods which we have already seen, uh, you know, being getting into Cochrane Review to treat this group of veins. And we also know Clark's procedure, which has been just mentioned by, you know, Kasia Mayaki, and, uh, you know, he's really doing a great work. And I think we really need to do a lot of studies to see that the plain sclerotherapy and the class, where do they stand in the future? So we need to have a flavor suite. And, you know, the most important thing is that if you make the patient stand and you, if you see that the patient has got a lot of veins, you need to do a preoperative duplex scan to see the perforators or the depot veins has got a refluxing veins or not. So you can do uh, the laser procedure here. And uh, once you do the laser procedure and uh, you can use the different spot sizes and all, you know, we are going to discuss that later. And after that, you can inject a sclerotherapy. In here, we are injecting a 75% dextrose into the vein under augmented reality. So you can get a very good results if you do the procedure properly in this group of patients, especially in the foot veins, which really uh, only a plain sclerotherapy may cause a skin necrosis, especially the veins which are nearly in the epidermis. Now, this picture really shows that you should not treat the telangiectasia certain reticular veins directly without missing the deeper reflux. So you, because you must treat SPJ or SFJs or perforators before you embark on the C1 veins, because what we have observed is that if you treat the deeper refluxes and in the future, if you observe them two to three months later, a lot of these veins sometimes they disappear and the patient does not require any treatment. Now, this is the results what we want. You know, you, whatever treatment or methods you want to use, but we definitely don't want this. You know, a skin burn, a pigmentation, a scarring, definitely not. So we are going to uh, place this talk into two complications because of sclero and complication because of laser. There are a huge amount of complications which can happen from sclerotherapy. We are just going to go one by one. But the major causes of this is insufficient delivery of drug, high concentration and pressure, and imprecise injections which are there outside the lumen. The most common complication is in hyperpigmentation. And normally it disappears within six months to one year, but it can persist in one to two percent. And if you can look into the percentages, dextrose and gleason causes the least hyperpigmentation. The pigmentation can be linear or punctate and the, the lot of causes which has been documented, why you get this pigmentation? Because the patient has come for cosmetic region, the pigmentation is not a very good idea to have. So the basic concept is less inflammation, you will get less pigment. So use a sclerosant which are lighter and foam is stronger than the liquid. So if you have to use foam, use a lower concentrations. Technique is very, very important. We should always limit the pressure what, by which you inject into the vein. Look into the syringe size. You have to understand 2.5 ml syringe or a 3 ml syringe will inject at a lower pressure as compared to a 1 ml syringe. And this is a basic physics. Similarly, you will get more pigmentation in the legs as compared to if you treat the hands because of the gravitational pressure, you will have an extravasation of the RPCs. Similarly, a blue leg telangiectasias will cause you more pigmentation as compared to the red pigment, red vessels if you treat them. Dark color or Asians, they are more prone. If the patient has got a higher serum ferritin level, you get more pigment. So therefore you should avoid an iron supplement for one month for this group of patients. If your patients previously had an hyperpigmentation, try to use an antihistaminics, you know, into the perioperative procedures and try to avoid doing the procedures in the perimenstrual or the ovulation period of the female. If the patient is on drugs, something like a minocycline, then you should see if the patient can stop this drug when you are doing a sclerotherapy. If the patient has got a coagulum, try to remove them because that can cause an inflammation and result in pigmentation. And also important is how you inject. So there are a lot of uh, uh, guidelines and the procedures. How do we make an injection? But when we do the injection in this uh, plain scalar therapy, we use a 30 gauge needle with a wibble up. We bend the needle a little bit. And this is the procedure. We puncture the skin. 
and maintain a small pressure on the plunger and try to inject uh, the needle into the vein. I've just put in a small video just to show you uh, what I mean. So what we are using is a very dilute sclerosin foam, 30 gauge needle, a bandane, and I'm just putting a small pressure on the plunger and trying to move forward gently into the uh, telangiectasia, injectase very small. As soon as I'm inside it, so can, you can see the whole telangiectasia uh, that disappears. And if you are injected properly, then there is no extra vacation. And if you follow these patients up, these patients will have very good results. In terms of treatment, if it really persists, mostly we do conservative. You can use some drugs like a 20% TCAs and retinin creams. Compression for treating, after treating spider veins, there are still controversies uh, in the literature, we still don't know. But if you have an hemocytin pigment, which is outside the vessel causing a pigment, it is very susceptible to 410 to 450 nanometer. So we can treat it with the lasers, we can use a pulse dye, we can use an IPL, and we can also use a ruby laser, and we can also use an NDY 1064. All these lasers can help us in removing the pigment if you have a pigment which is persistent more than one year. We can get a temporary swelling, which is more in the ankle because of the gravitational pressure. We can treat it with local steroid creams and compression. Matting is a very important complication. It is appearance of the new fine veins, which happens after sclerotherapy in a different area. So why it happens is if you cause more injury, you will get more ischemia, you will uh, promote new vascularization. This rarely happens in the face, hand and chest and age male and standing uh, for a longer time does not predispose to the formation of matting. Normally it can occur in few days to three weeks. It's persistent more than one year, only in two to three persons. That's good for us, but less inflammation, you will get less TM. So therefore, if you use a dilute sclerosins and if you compress the veins, then will be less thrombus, you will get less matting. If you patient is prone to TM, then there are a few things we can do. We can inject a protamine along with the sclerosin. We can use a pentoxic filing. We can use an H1 inhibitors. And if they are still persisting, we can treat them with an NDY 532 nanometer laser. Some of these patients can also have pain, especially if you inject in ankles, feet, upper medial thigh, and medial knees. But the important thing about this is when you are using a dilute STS, this is the agent, if you are going to inject outside the vessel, it's going to pain. But if you are injecting in the vessel, normally it does not pain. So which is a very good marker, because if you're doing it without local anesthesia or a cream, so that because you can know that you are exactly inside the vessel and not outside the vessel. You can get a tape blisters, you can get folliculitis, especially in Asian countries or tropical countries. Now recurrence. The recurrence normally happens you know, in the reticular veins because you can form a thrombus and it can recanalize. But normally in the telangiectasia, the vessels are very small. So you don't normally form uh, big thrombuses causing a recanalization. So normally these veins are new or the leftovers. You can get a cutaneous necrosis, especially if you come because of extra positions and arterial injections. So that's why you need to know exactly what concentrations you are going to use when you're going to treat these veins and how much volume you're going to put in. But important is that the glycerin as a dextrose, you really get a much lesser cutaneous necrosis as compared to the other detergents. You can also get an NLD and that can occur at all concentrations, especially in area which has got rich arterial networks. Inter-arterial injections, this, this is important because 10% of the telangiectasia, they are associated with avicians or domal arterioles. So that's why if you use in higher uh, viscous uh, drugs like glycerin or a dextrose, the chances of this will be much lower. Coming to, if you get an extravasation, what should you do? You can either, if you put in too much uh, extravasation, which should not happen in an experienced hands, you can still dilute the sclerosin with saline injections, or you can put in a hyaluronidase, you know, I put in the doses at multiple sites to dissolve the sclerosin and it can get diffused. You can treat the cutaneous necrosis just like any other skin damage and it normally heals within four to six weeks. You can get multiple allergic reactions like a localized urticaria, which normally disappears within 30 minutes. You can get a systemic reaction. Very important to differentiate anaphylaxis, which has got a heart rate increase from a vasovagal reaction, which will get a bradycardia. So because this is very important and this can happen. So we have three patients in the last 20 years who had these reactions. 
Coming to allergic reactions with an STD, it is slightly higher than the polydocanol, but it's not huge. It's around 0.3%, and it normally happens because of the impurities which are there in this uh, drug manufacturing called as carbitalol. Polydocanol, the incidence is around 0.01%. It is much lesser. You can also get a thrombophilitis, and normally it's get because of the lack of compression or significant reflux into the treated vein. It can be treated with an NACID, so you can take the blood out, and uh, you know once you've taken the blood out, there'll be less inflammation, and this infection uh, will settle down. Especially in the perimalleolar area on the medial side, if you get a lot of veins there, then you have to be very careful because, especially in thin patients, the posterior tibial artery is very very close. So sometimes you can put an injection into this. So you have to be very very careful what you are doing there. Then you get a lot of neurological events you can get. You can get a stroke, very, very, very rarely a death. You can get a nerve damage by the direct injections. You can get a migraines or headache, which are normally really temporarily and they disappear with time. Very rarely you can get a DVT. Up to 13% of the patients with telangiectic veins, they are at risk of spreading the sclerosis solution into the deep venous system. But the dilution, what we use of the sclerosis in the veins, in these veins, and the amount of volume what we use normally should not cause you deep venous thrombosis unless you are injecting uh, a huge amount and in higher uh, concentrations. If the patient is on OCP, you should try to avoid to stop it. If you cannot stop it, try to change it to transdermal steroid rather than the oral because that can bypass the liver. Uh, tamoxifen is another you know very common drug because uh, these days when these patients come for sclerotherapy. You should be careful while you are doing the sclero in them. As pregnancy, you should try to avoid them uh, at least up to six weeks after the delivery. Rarely you can get an air embolism, but in a French study of 6,400 patients, 16 episodes happened of uh, eye symptoms uh, when you are treating C1 veins. So the incidence is low. It was not uh, permanent, and all this disappeared within uh, 15 minutes to six hours. You can get a scotomas in some patients, but they are all temporarily. If you look into this study by uh, Professor Goldman, it shows that STD versus polydocanol, you got a similar efficacy and similar adverse event. There are a lot of such publications which are there. And there have been a lot of publications which had shown that if you are an experienced person, any sclerosin you use, you can get a similar results. There are two very important studies published on Clarks. These are the largest series published by Kasimiyaki, which shows that patient 86% of the patients get satisfactory result of very minimal complications, which are less than 1%, and there are no major complications which happens if you treat this C1 varicose vein patients. Coming to the complications with laser, the important thing is when you're doing the laser, you must know how much to do it. So if you get a bluish or grease discoloration visible on the skin surface and you're getting a blanching or disappearing, you know, you should stop. Don't keep on doing it more. There are a huge amount of side effects which can happen and they are normally happening because you don't know your machine. The lack of pain, uh, purpura, bleeding, swelling, and you can get like blister formations, you can get an infection, especially if the patient is giving a history of herpes simplex, like maybe five to six episodes in the last one year, then if you treat the legs with a laser, then there could be a reactivation. So you can start a prophylactic ASAC lobe. You can get these patients uh, with a hyperpigmentation, uh, more in patients with you know, darker skin types, but normally it fades off within two to six months, we, but we can use the topical bleaching creams. You can get complications like a skin lightening, skin texture changes and scarring. Normally they are happening because you're damaging the collagen surrounding and you are passing on the heat more than what is required. And the persistence of the lesion is one of the major uh, side effects, you know, what we were discussing on the facial veins. Uh, this is a problem with the lasers. Post care, you can, if there is an arrhythmia of burning, you should use an ice packs. You should avoid a sun exposure for around 24 hours. You can use an SPF creams. Non irritating soaps can be used to wash the area after 24 hours. You should avoid the swimming or prolonged bath. And leg vein result, we must wait for four to six weeks for it to be noticed. The contraindications have already been covered, so I will not come again. Now, this is one of the very important slide I feel, last two slides. When you're doing the laser, the important thing is you see the smaller vessels, we shoot the shorter pulses. If you, the depth of the vessel is more, then you should use a larger spot, longer wavelength, and longer pulse with cooling. If you have a darker skin, try to use a longer wavelength so it can go deeper, 
and longer pulse and longer pulse intervals. And try to use, if you're using an overlapping less than 10% to decrease the scarring. And there is something called a stacking. So what if you want to pass on a higher energy, so you can put in two stacks rather than giving one higher energy shot. So that will decrease the pain and also uh, causes uh, less heating uh, damage to the surrounding tissues. If you are treating the fragile areas like bones, use less energy. I feel the pulse duration is still very important. There has been one or two publication which shows that this is not the important thing, but I still feel that if you are starting the laser and you, you are really not know, then this is a very important safety feature because uh, how much duration, the heat, your the laser energy, you're going to give it. Because if you put in too much energy into the system, all the complications of laser will happen. So for that, I still feel that TRT is very important to have a basic understanding uh, that if you are treating a very small micro vessel, your pulse width should not be more than 20 milliseconds. But if you are treating a C2 varicose veins or something like reticular veins, then your pulse width can be kept at 15 to 30 milliseconds, up to 50 milliseconds in a two millimeter vessel. The two important things, I feel the consent and the photographic documentation is very important. And this is a very important slide that if you are treating uh, telangiectasia, very superficial, then you should use a short wavelength, short pulse width, small spot size, and low fluency, and vice versa. So this is the last slide, I think, and which later you use well. So if you have a less than one millimeter, you can use a KTP, which is a very superficial laser, and it's a 532 and you can use an FPDL, you can use an NDVAG and IPLS, but if you are treating uh, reticular veins, you can use uh, larger diameter deep black vessels, uh, you can use NDVAG, Alexandrite, diode and IPLS. So in conclusion, both sclerotherapy and lasers can be used in the treatment, but you should have the proper knowledge and technique is the basics to prevent complications and get good cosmetic results. Thank you. And thank you so much, Raul, uh, for another wonderful lecture. So if you can stop sharing uh, your screen, we'll start uh, the World uh, Scientific Round uh, immediately with uh, Brazil. So it's my pleasure to introduce a dear friend, uh, Rodrigo Bono Fukushima from uh, the Miyake Group. And uh, Rodrigo, the mic is on you now for the question to our friend Raul. Hello, Sergio. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Havu, for this magnificent presentation. So we all know that hyperpigmentation is one of the most common complications we all have in our office. So regarding hyperpigmentation and its pathophysiology, in our opinion, what would be the rationale for choosing the sclerotherapy technique considering variables such as the type of lesion and the treatment region? Uh, you see, hyperpigmentation normally happens because you get an RBC which goes out of the vessel. So it's important is, so if you are using a sclerodent, anything, you know, all these telangiectasias, as you know, they're very thin vessels and you get an epidermis inside. So if you use a very high uh, irritant, this the basement membrane will get destroyed. The RBCs will go out. So one should use a dilute sclerodent and one should use uh, compression if you're using a reticular veins in this group of patients to prevent an inflammation. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Rodrigo and Raul. And now we fly all the way to Europe uh, and it will be Professor Chi honor to introduce uh, our continental expert representative, Willy. Yeah, next we have uh, Dr. Oren uh, Solario to, um, to give his question from Romania. Sorry, are you with us? You are muted. Can you hear me? Yes. So we, we have with us uh, Professor Odin Solario from uh, uh, the University of Romania, president of the Romanian Society of Phlebology. Thank you for inviting me to this excellent webinar and Sergio, congratulations for this organization. And uh, I have uh, two questions, small question. First of all, I would like to, to congratulate for uh, this excellent review through sclerotherapy. And my first question is, uh, what do you use in telangiectasy, foam or liquid? And the second one, what is your opinion about sclerotherapy in upper limbs, 
because uh, not point of view aesthetic but legal because you destroy the uh, venous access to the treatment sure Thank i think these are very important questions the first of all uh, if i'm using the telangiectasias so uh, i need to know uh, how much uh, area i have to treat so if i'm treating a very small area i use a liquid and i use 1 to 5 liquid and if i'm using a very big areas then the volume of liquid is quite a lot so then i try to use a foam but when i'm using a foam i dilute it slightly more as compared to what i'm using the liquid so if i'm using a liquid let's say 0.25 then i will dilute it by 50% more and then make a foam of it so actually talking i'm making a foam of 0.12 or 0.15 and then i'm i think uh, concentration is one important thing and the amount of fluid what you are injecting is very important so i don't push the fluid so i just keep a small pressure on the plunger as soon as it flows into the vessel i see the disappearance of the vessel i stop so as i can show you in the video coming to the hand veins i don't inject much i do very rarely only if the patient really pushes me and if the patient comes in i actually normally send the patient back at least once so that the patient goes home thinks about it again at least twice and i try to discourage the patient and try to show my hand veins also that this is normal but you do get patients in the peri marriage area because they some patients have got really very prominent hand veins and uh, so that's the only patients we inject but it's not very common then and, and uh, you know if the patient uh, has you know do it so we video consenting is the most important thing in this group of patients yes so we, we thank you a lot professor olario for his participation and also Raul for the answer and now it will be professor bottini honor to introduce uh, another friend from india thank you uh, let me introduce dr shoi padaria from the venus association association of india uh, shoi shoi can you hear us i see is here Okay yeah yeah here you are uh, Oscar thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you Sergio and Willy for having me on this wonderful platform Raul a fantastic comprehensive review of everything to do with sclerotherapy and the complications very informative um as you all know i come from the city of mumbai which is the center of the film and television industry of this country in the last 20 years i have been treating a lot of the film stars and tv personalities with sclerotherapy for their spider veins and telangiectasia mm -hmm. a small percentage of these patients do suffer from significant pigmentation which can be long lasting and this is a catastrophe for us so what i would specifically like to ask you uh, in this regard is that how do we minimize the risk of pigmentation in these patients one by which sclerosin should be used two what is the exact minimal concentration of sclerosin that we should use and thirdly are there any specific medications which which you which we should use before and after the procedure to make sure that they don't get pigmentation i wouldn't mind repeating the procedure in these patients but to avoid pigmentation at any cost absolutely and you know this that's why i put in the first complications as hyperpigmentation the good thing about that is that if you tell this patient before the procedure that if you will get the hyperpigmentation that this will disappear within 6 months to 1 year so this is a very important thing and in my consent form hyperpigmentation is at the top in terms of complications because a lot of these patients they come for cosmetic problems so there is an issue about it now how do you can decrease it always try i always try to use the dilutional form the most dilute i can use so if i have to use a blue or the red telangiectasias so maybe as i said 0.12 or 1 to 5 or 0.25 not more than this if i'm using an std because that's the only we don't have the polydocanol available you know uh, the drug in our country so i'm using an std so i will use a very dilute an std so have we have we already got a 75% dextrose so i will use a very small amount of dextrose so if you uh, look into my slides uh, dextrose in the glycerin got the lowest incidence of hyperpigmentation and but there are some publication which have shown that the hyperpigmentation rate 
with very dilute acidity polydocanols and glycerin dextrose is similar second is what you can do is that uh, conservative treatment if the patient gets a hyperpigmentation but you can also start this patient if the patient has got propensity then you can start this patient on antihistaminics uh, perioperative for one week because that decreases the inflammation that has been there are some publications on that then you should also use uh, the, these patients should avoid sun for some time you can also use an spf uh, creams which should be started there are some publication which shows you should start the cream 3 weeks before the procedure in the areas where you are going to do it and continue that for another 2 weeks after the procedure so uh, you know uh, that will uh, sun protection cream uh, with a factor 50 uh, that is another possibility and i feel the most important point is the technique because if you have an extravasation of rbcs while you are doing it i've seen a lot of people doing it then that really makes a difference and also use a thinner needles because thinner the needles are uh, then the chances of extravasation of rbc will be much lesser and a lesser pressure and a 3 ml syringe so thank you thank you, thank you so much shaib and uh, raul uh, now we go toward the conclusion of the world scientific round we conclude the big with uh, dr marlin schul president of the american veins and lymphatic society a dear friend for many of us marlin the mic is for you Good morning, everyone, and again, thank you, uh, Sergio, Oscar, and Willie for the kind invitation, and, and it's great to see everybody here. I echo uh, Dr. Fabricio's, uh, uh, and I think all of our willingness to actually meet in person when the time permits. Um, my question, number one, congratulations on this talk. It was a thorough uh, discussion of the various treatment options and complications from vein treatment. Do you believe experience plays a role in reducing major complications from small vein treatment? And if so, how might we work to bridge the knowledge gap so that new providers entering the field are delivering optimal treatment with safeguards for our patients? I'll wait to hear. Thank you. Sorry, can you just repeat it? I should not, I think I have got the question wrong. Please, can, sorry, to, if you can repeat it, please. There are a lot of people that are entering the specialty of uh, managing patients with veins. The question was, yes. does experience play a role in reducing yeah. major complications? And if so, how can we bridge those gaps to make sure as new people enter the field that they're still providing safe treatment and delivering outcomes? I think it's a fantastic question. And I think if I see the whole talk and everything, the most important thing, if you want to avoid the complication, I both with laser and sclero is the training. is the training i have seen hundreds of people using the wrong doses wrong concentrations wrong syringes wrong needles and most of them they are using the laser machines without even actually understanding the basics of laser physics they actually you know i have seen in the groups getting discussions you know should we use an ipl should we use an ktp oh i think this vein reticular vein we should use a ktp you know you don't understand the ktp will not be able to reach there you know the basics of the physics laser physics and i think anybody who wants to get into this uh, they should have a very basic knowledge it's a very vast and it it is not that simple just to take a syringe make a foam and then just inject it you know people feel it is very simple it's actually if you feel it simple then you're not going to get the results that's the problem Thank you so much Marlene and uh, Raul and now again we deeply thank all the continental expert rep representatives involved in this uh, round and we welcome the questions from the audience Raul so looking at the question and answer box uh, I was getting worried because uh, she wasn't appearing yet but now we have her on podium again our Cleopatra of Flebology Wasilla Taha is asking you uh, it's actually she's writing a great uh, talk dear friend uh, Raul Gindal, as we are all still in the pandemic time of the nascent COVID, are there some instructions or precautions to consider in the context of the sclerotherapy? And of course, you know, uh, thank you, Vasila. And you know, guys, COVID is an inflammatory disease, and you know, a lot of publications are there that it really increases the chances of having an arterial and venous occlusions. so that's why if you are using a huge amount of sclerotherapy and i think if you are doing a lot of procedures on the deep venous you will get more chances of getting a deep venous thrombosis because we are getting a lot of patients who are asymptomatic and they are covid positive 
So if your clinic is not doing a COVID test in all the patients who are incoming and you're doing a sclerotherapy, then you should be a bit careful and should keep a very close watch on uh, these patients developing a deep venous thrombosis. And I, I take this chance to invite everybody to enjoy the recorded uh, video lesson of the webinar we took on sclerotherapy and COVID to have uh, a deeper look on uh, this uh, topic. Now we fly all the way to Mexico right? with our friend Ignazio Scotto asking and writing, fantastic presentation, congrats. What is your preference for the position of the leg during sclerotherapy? And if this influences the microthrombosis of reticular veins and telangiectasia? Yeah, this is a very important question because uh, there are a lot of people who uh, sometimes they don't inject it while lying down. So they put in the needles, uh, you know, put in the scalp veins while the patient is in a standing position and then they make the patient spine and then they make the patient leg up and then they inject it. I personally uh, don't do any of these things. I make the patient spine. If I'm just using uh, telangiectasias and spider veins, so I actually don't even do the Trendelenburg position and make the patient supine and that is more than enough because the moment you use the cool air on this, all these venous uh, systems, they get into spasm. So you don't need to actually raise your leg because that makes the patient uncomfortable. But if I'm using a huge amount of uh, C2 varicose veins and I'm doing the sclero, then definitely I like to do uh, Trendelenburg position and leg up and while I'm injecting and uh, with a pressure so that there is least amount of blood in the vessels while I'm injecting the foam. Thank you so much, Raul. And now we have a question from Annelise. There is no surname, I guess it's three triggers from Brazil. And uh, the question is, Dr. Raul, considering the possible known complications of the procedures, how do you deal with patients' expectations, especially about aesthetical outcomes? Yes, and uh, this is the most important. And I think uh, the best thing you can learn is from Kasumiyaki in this because you know he takes two important things. One is the consenting. So most of the patients for cosmetic, we are doing a video consenting. And second is the photographic documentation. So if you have a photographic documentation before and after, and second is if you're taking a proper consent, so normally you should not have a problem. But if the, some patient is very finicky, if you would have put in, see my slide, I put in a contraindication to the cosmetic procedure if the patient is really very finicky because then you have to be very careful because one of the most, uh, uh, this is one of the most litigated procedure in the world. So you have to be very careful what you're doing. Thank you, Raul. And now we have a question from Professor Lowe Kabnik. We all know him. What about the use of Deflon? Do you see less pigmentation with those that are on statins? Uh, really, uh, personally, uh, I don't use Deflon in this group of patients at all. Um, I use Deflon very uh, sparsely and especially only in patients with venous ulcers. And uh, regarding statins and pigmentation, I have not come across uh, any correlation personally. Uh, so in my practice, I'll not be able to comment on that. Uh, is it more or less? Yeah, th there are some interesting studies coming out, but just uh, recent uh, on venous active drugs like surodexide uh, that are acting on the pigmentation in sclerotherapy. But I think this opened the floor to analyzing evidence-based data in aesthetic. And this would actually be my question to you and also Fabricio. We have been all involved in last V winter document uh, analysis of the global guidelines. And if you remember, we were pointing out three months of um, uh, maximum follow-up in uh, aesthetic uh, philbology papers. What is your feeling about uh, the, f the shortest follow-up we could consider uh, valid before considering uh, the results reliable in, uh, in aesthetic treatment? I think three months is required you know, not, not less than eight weeks. Fabricio, would you like to comment on this? Yes, but I have not the answer for this question, but I think three months is gonna be good because we all know that the venous disease is progressive, it, it, it will never end. So, but I think in terms of follow-up, three months are, are, if we're thinking about uh, hyperpigmentation when we're following up these patients, we need to wait uh, until six months. So 70% of hyperpigmentation disappears until uh, six months and 100% uh, until one year, but I think three to six months. And indeed, since we are always trying to focus on evidence-based data and fake news free information, I think it's also important to point out that it, it would be pretty impossible for a US colleague to answer to the question related to MPFF because they don't have approval for that 
same for UK. So that is another gap I think we should uh, cover in the future. Do you have some opinion on this or? Raul? Uh, MPPF, uh, you know, we have been using Teflon uh, for such a long time and, uh, you know. But um, what I mean is that they cannot use that in US, it's not approved. Same in yeah. UK, so we have dispersed data on, on this. So yeah, it's, it's I, another, I know. Uh, it's but another gap to close. So there will be a problem because we don't have uh, actual uh, data, but in our clinical setups, what we have seen is that uh, that we are not using this drug in especially uh, cosmetic purposes, but yes, varicose veins, venous ulcers, yes. Yeah. It would be interesting, I think, to see if these venous active drugs like MPFF who have demonstrated venous active roles can decrease the venous hypertension to a level for which you can improve the aesthetic result because of that. But up to my knowledge, we still have to work on that. Do you have a comment yeah. on this? Because technically it, be... it has been demonstrated you reduce the venous hypertension. So if you reduce the venous hypertension, potentially you could have a better result, but. Theoretically, yes. Uh, theoretically, yes, it makes sense. And, uh, but practically, I don't know. It is. So very last question from Italy. Let me translate this for you. Maria Parizella is asking you, um, which kind of tips and tricks could you give us on obese patients before laser uh, treatment of telangiectasia. Do you have some tips and tricks for obese patients with uh, transdermal laser? If you're, you understand what I mean, Raul? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, but uh, it, it's sort of similar because, uh, especially in the obese patients, um, uh, if, if the veins are, you know, in the superficial in the epidermis, you use in the same way. And uh, if there are radicular veins, uh, you know, sometimes you have to use an ultrasound. Sometimes they are not visible and within, you know, naked eye. And then in that group of patients, because uh, especially in the obese patients, when I'm treating uh, telling Jatasias, I make sure that I do an ultrasound in that area to make sure that there are no perforators. Because in thin patients, you can see the visibly uh, the reticular veins. But in obese patients, sometimes you can miss the perforators uh, to the telling Jatasia. So I think, uh, uh, and you know, as you know, it's very important to treat the perforators and the reticulars before you treat the telling that is here. So that is one of the important things I would like to do in this group of patients. And thank you so much, Raul. And also, Fabricio, we are closing up the scientific time and we're going to wrap up the take home messages. I'm always uh, surprised. I'm used to know the quality of your talks, but I'm always surprised to see that you always uh, beat yourself. So thank you so much for this wonderful contribution. And now it's uh, time to give the mic uh, to the honorary chairs. Unfortunately, Professor Goldman is having technical issues He's in joining us. Uh, he delivered uh, his recorded video lessons in the platform, so you can enjoy that over there. It's my deep pleasure to introduce a uh, master of the field, Professor Kikuchi Rodrigo from uh, the Vascular Excellence Clinic in Brazil. Rodrigo, if you want to share your screen, if you have some slides, we are looking forward for taking on some messages according to okay. your suggestion. Okay, right. Thank you, Sergio, and thank you all. Congratulations for the work. Uh, thank you for the invitation to make the, some comments on, on, the, on both presentations. Uh, of course, it is uh, very challenging to, to treat um, telangiectasias. You all can see that. But uh, first of all, both of the presenters, they said that uh, it's paramount to, to look for the source of the, the lesion even to treat or to, to avoid complications. But I, I want you, you all to remember that sometimes uh, it's not only the ultrasound or the, the, the augmented reality or, or phleboscopy that you show us the, the, the source. Uh, we need to, to look a little deeper or, or shallower uh, to the to the skin because uh, we do have it's described very uh, uh, for a very long time ago that we do have two two horizontal lines of circulation and one is controlled by by uh, like sphincters is moved muscle cells so it's kind of different thing way to think and a different way to treat also uh, nowadays we're looking for uh, different physiopathologies on 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 uh, telangiectasias. And as Sergio said uh, moments before, uh, maybe the venoactive drugs may have a, a role here on the inflammatory uh, issues causing telangiectasia. So uh, pay, a, pay attention on that. And uh, new studies uh, with new, uh, new devices show us that, that the, the circulation of the skin is much more uh, 
complex than we, we thought. So sometimes like in medding or, or some complications, we're looking for the cause and uh, looking for the source, where it's coming, this, this, this new, new uh, telangiectasias, and sometimes it's coming from the, the sides. Uh, we do have a lot of a lot of uh, things to 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 work on and a lot of treatments. And Dr. Santiago um, put a, a, a something about talk about something about pain. But uh, here in, in Brazil, I'm, I've been using uh, nitrous oxide and hypnosis uh, in in my office, and I, I invite you to know better these techniques because. Uh, nowadays, I, I really don't have much, much uh, issues on, on uh, pain, pain uh, even when I'm, I'm performing transcutaneous laser, which is the, the painful technique that we can use. Regarding, regarding lasers, uh, I cannot agree that the, the 1064 is the best is the best wavelength. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the more versatile, but not the best. Because uh, the best depends on what kind of lesion, what kind of telangiectasia are you treating. So uh, physics is mandatory to, to perform transcutaneous laser better. And, uh, and also the, the, the outputs, uh, like we can, we can uh, shoot a laser with a long pulse or nanoseconds and it makes a very different uh, behavior on, 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 on tissue. So paying attention to that is, is, is important for you to understand which kind of laser to use in each lesion. So uh, it's not very hard, although it's not on the, on the educational program of most of the phlebologists in the world. So uh, maybe we should uh, pay a, a little bit more attention on, on physics basics and even, even on engineering. Because perfect laser, of course, uh, it doesn't exist. But um, the way this laser the, delivers the energy is important. It can be uh, in a, in a free, free, char free discharge that we call, or in, uh, more homogeneous, and it makes a difference on the, the, on the temperature that we get on the skin. And also the, the beam shape, uh, oops, Sorry, uh, the beam shape is, is important because uh, it's, it makes a difference on, on the reaction, okay? Uh, last thing, sclerotherapy. Of course, we do not have the perfect solution, but uh, sometimes mixing, uh, it's better than using one. It is, this is a, a brand new paper. It's in press or, uh, yet, and the, uh, showing that the, the combination is better than and then one alone. And sometimes we should look for histology like Dr. Bush did it and found a virtual perfect a concentration of polydocanol for telangiectasias that point, that would be 0.3. So uh, that way we can put the right tools in the right hands and using the right way, okay? Uh, we need to use the intelligence to, to make things better, to make treatment better and why not to make the world better? So be, be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Kikuchi. Outstanding taking on message uh, uh, contribution. Now it's uh, my pleasure to pass uh, the mic to a dear friend and also great dermatologist from the American Veins and Lymphatic Society, Margaret Mann. Margaret? Thank you so much, Sergio. This has been fantastic. And um, I just want to thank everyone, especially the speakers, amazing lectures. Um, and also, Sergio, this has been quite a, um, a, an endeavor for many weeks. So thank you for organizing this. It's been amazing for all of us. Um, in regards to the talks today, um, my, I have three main points. So my first one is to really set realistic expectations with our patients when we start um, sclerotherapy and laser treatment. Um, remember, this is an aesthetic treatment. So at the end of the day, our patients are finicky. Their, um, their level of tolerance for side effects are very low. Um, and I love this paper that Dr. Fabricio and Willie published, um, I think maybe in the last year or two, about photos and how important photos are. So many of our patients forget 
what their veins look like um, after treatment, that many times I tell patients, I will guarantee them after scleral therapy, their vision will be better because they will look much more closely at their veins than they ever did before. And so, so frequently they'll come back in and say, well, what about this one? What about that one? I don't remember that being there. And I go, well, let's look at the photos. And so many times they are already there from prior. So definitely make sure you set realistic expectations about pigmentation, about what can be, you know, that sometimes can take three to six months. And also um, make sure patients know what was there before so they're not things that you cause. In regards to laser versus sclerotherapy, it's always this, which one should I use? Um, and I think all of us agree that sclerotherapy at the end of the day is really still the gold standard. Um, it is much cheaper. You can treat such a wide variety of vessels from telangiectasias to reticular veins that with laser systems, you really have to purchase more than one. And when it comes to cost, there's no doubt sclerotherapy is, in my opinion, the better, more versatile choice to begin with. Um, do understand, and I think the, the speakers gave amazing talks about minimal effective concentration. Um, be thorough and comprehensive in how you treat a cluster of vein rather than just um, haphazardly treating here and there because you're gonna get better results. And I absolutely agree with Marlon that at the end of the day, it's while it seems um, deceptively simple, there are important techniques that um, even now, as I've done it for many years, I find that I've adopted and have improved my sclerotherapy results. And then finally, in terms of laser, um, they are very expensive. Um, so even though I, in my office, have many lasers, I'm a dermatologist by training as well, um, but it is an investment. And so um, as Fabrizio mentioned, it has to be a worthwhile partaking for your office. So you can't just use it to treat um, veins on the legs because you could easily do that with sclerotherapy. Um, in my office, I often find that facial veins are one area that I do love using lasers for. Um, I know it is controversial, but I don't like doing sclerotherapy on the face. I do think it's much safer to do laser treatments um, in that area. And then also, I call it my, my final treatment. When patients have scattered leftover vessels, this is one area where using a laser is very appropriate. Um, but what's important is to understand endpoints. So at the end of the day, when you purchase a laser, the reps will tell you, oh, these are the settings you can use. Um, but it is so important to understand the physics behind it. How do you, um, what is the endpoint you're looking for? How do you know you are actually where you need to be? How do you tailor the spot size, the fluence? Um, how do you adjust all of that? Because that's really what makes somebody uh, an expert versus a beginner. Um, and then, Finally, a 1064, I do love, but you have to be super careful with this laser. Never double pulse. I always space my pulse and I always wait a second before each pulse because you can easily cause ulceration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for having demonstrated the honorary chair role is well put on you. So now we conclude uh, with uh, a big presence, Professor Kazu Miyaki in its new introduction, uh, Klax uh, Technique Father. So Kazu, are you with us? Hello. Yes. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We cannot see you. Can you turn okay. on? Yeah, now we can see you. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. Well, I will start with uh, the last thing I took, uh, I wrote because it's really important. Marlin Shu, I had a the, the, the pleasure to play golf with him and Lisa Montangelo in, in Italy, in Rome. And uh, he said something very important. Uh, how, uh, does the experience play plays role to help to deliver the outcome? And how to guide the new phlebologist? And also Dr. Margaret said at the end of her comments here now that the 1064 is really dangerous and you can burn the skin. Like, uh, I really don't agree with this. Only if you follow the instructions of the dealers, of the, the one that say, sell the laces, because they really want to show the effect right now, right there. To have uh, safety and uh, to have result, you need to use low energy and cook the vein slowly. And Margaret said that as well. Well, 
first, I will start with Fabricio. I took some comments here. Uh, congratulations for Fabricio and, and Raul talks are really amazing talks. Uh, a lot of information right there. And uh, he said about the laser physics. And one thing that I really, since the beginning, I didn't agree is the th thermal relaxed section time, thermal relaxation time. This, and I put on the, the chat there, uh, a paper saying that is an updated uh, concept. And right in the beginning, in 1999, I started to use intense pulse light combined with dextrose in 1995. In 1999, the 1064, I started to use the 1064 long pulse with a six millimeter spot size. And I have tested this, this laser comparing 18 milliseconds and 16 milliseconds and had no, no difference. And to change the settings between your session, you lose a lot of time and class is time consuming. That's why I teach all the, the, my, my fellows and to use uh, the same setting. The laser itself is really safe and you just need to cook the vein. That means you use 50 joules per centimeter squared to 70 joules per centimeter squared, always six millimeter spot size, the big spot size and always 15 milliseconds, which is useful for all the situations. Bigger veins up to 1.5, sometimes two millimeters, and till injectation. The same setting for everyone. You will cook the vein because all the energy will go through the skin and will pass through the till injectations and the deeper veins. The big spot size is not, is not focused at all at the bottom of the inverted cone of energy that it forms after crossing the skin barrier. Well, and uh, I only use the monotherapy in the facial. And there is one thing at, that Fabricio said, very interesting slide about the doors and the yellow door is the leg veins. And you, you really can use the, the laser for a lot of, uh, all, all, the, all, all, all the skin, the, the head, neck, elbow, uh, breast after breast augmentation. Sometimes I perform clacks on the on the breast, but the 95% of the situations in my clinic, I use 1064, and 99.9% .9 I use the same setting. It means six millimeter and 15 milliseconds, and that means you really the laser is really easy to use. And I've been teaching a lot of young phlebologists and they start to perform right away. Uh, Havu, uh, he, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, Hau uh, Jindal, he said about the darker skin and he has, a, a, of course, a lot of experience with the darker skin. This is really interesting. And, but the main point that I believe it's, we, we need to take care is the classification. If we classify the patient and take out the patients that have reflux from the deep venous system. They are, in my classification, the score nine one, they are score six and above. That means they are telangiectasias or they have a, a feeder vein. They are not connected to a refluxing axial reflux. That means you will achieve a better result if you scan all the patient and get rid of the, all the bigger veins. And while you cook the vein using the laser, you just have to, to pass two, three times with the laser. Sometimes you don't see any effect at all right away, but as I can, I, I, I've proved already with uh, pathological insemination after a phlebectomy in experimental study, the vein itself, it will have edema of the vein wall and destruction of the endothelium. That will lead to internal diameter reduction and this will help you to inject very low dose of dextrose in the, in the case of clats. I inject 0 0.01 ml. It's, it's uh, me, Kazu, reminding you that the time is passing by. Okay. <laughs> and I inject 0 0.01 ml. Well, then the take home message to summarize everything, it's diagnosis first. Photo documentation is really important as you are treating uh, private practice. Use low energy that will avoid 
uh, you, you, you less you, you lead to less less pain, and we are performing a lot of hybrid procedures where we under sedation, the propofol, sedation and other uh, products, anesthesiologists is there. We perform endovenous laser ligation of the peripheral veins and also clax with two devices, uh, two doctors, and in three hours we really change the result the the patients really, the outcome is really awesome. And the return of the, or the investment, when you invest in a private practice, you buy a lot of devices and uh, the money itself is not so much. If you put this money in the bank, it will per month give you one session, one class session. And if you decide to invite, to invest in a static labology in a private practice setting, you will have to uh, focus on that. You cannot like open a restaurant and sell a cheap hamburger and like a very fancy food. You need to focus on that market. That means you have the devices, you need to use those devices because the result is much better than the other techniques. Kazu, I need to stop you because if not, they will have no point in coming to IMAP and joining all the other teachings if you keep on saying everything now. I just added that. So, yeah. so, so let me now turn toward the end of uh, this webinar, deeply thanking everybody, starting from uh, the first travel mates, so friends and colleagues and family to me, Professor Bottin and Professor Chi for the final remarks. Oscar. Okay, thank you. Another Sunday with excellent presentations and a great brainstorming. We'll meet again next Sunday. Thank you all and see you then. Thank you so much. Will it? Yeah, I'll be sure when the good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> see you next week. Thank you so much for being so operative. Thank you so much to all the ones involved in this group effort. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our Michael Jordan and Andrew Joig uh, uh, champs in our field also for the time they will take to answer to the questions in written form during the week. We look forward for being together next Sunday on a coagulation with truly giants of the field. Before saying goodbye, I'd like to have a last word uh, from dear friends who are believing in teamwork and international uh, uh, teamwork indeed and also in gender equality. So first I will give the mic uh, to Marlene Schul and uh, Margaret Mann uh, for a nice initiative of the VLS and then to Lorena Grillo for next Saturday initiative. Margaret or Marlene, would you like to say a word? Uh, just real quick, Sergio, a great example of how you can have an outstanding virtual meeting. Um, Margaret is our uh, chair of the meeting this year, and, and I can tell you the amount of effort, uh, and we've had a lot of experience watching other events and optimizing what we're gonna be able to provide in October. I'm gonna introduce Margaret and have her give an overview of what, what our meeting's gonna show in October. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna personally invite all of you guys to our meeting. So October 15th through the 18th, it's a four day conference. We have four simultaneous tracks, um, superficial deep veins, lymphedema, ultrasound. It's going to cover both beginners and experts um, in the field. Um, we have a total of 80 CME hours. Um, everything's going to be recorded, so you have the chance to go back and rewatch everything till the end of the year. Um, all of it is going to be interactive, case presentations, question and answer, much of the stuff that Sergio has done. Fantastic. Um, and Sergio, Marlon, Willie, lots of folks here are involved with the meeting. Um, last thing, prices have been reduced significantly from our in-person meeting. Um, it's at least about five or $600 less than what we normally charge. And for everybody who is from a developing country, there's an additional 40% off. So I hope all of you guys will join us in October. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, a quick lap toward South America with Lorena Grillo. Lorena, would you like to tell us about next Saturday? Thank you. I want to invite all of the colleagues and related professionals to join us next Saturday, August 22nd, in this same schedule and participate through Zoom, Facebook or YouTube. Uh, and we'll have great faculty in this Women to the World in Pathology that will include a worldwide group of dynamic women, women in the field. Uh, we thank Dr. Bottini and you, Dr. Giannisini, for a allowing us uh, to support uh, this um, pre-Congress activity uh, forward to the support in Latin America and also gender equality. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much all. Deeply thank to all the ones who join us uh, today in this group effort. Sorry if we went five minutes later, but we are like giants and we really didn't want to stop uh, their teachings and we look forward to be on together next uh, Sunday. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Ciao. Bye. Oh, bye bye. Bye. Bye.